in terms of questions and things like that, um, we're going to hold all the questions till the end, except if a committee member has a clarification that they need to address during the presentation. And so, um, and then after the end of the presentation, uh, we'll open it up to the committee first to ask uh, questions of John, and then we'll open it up to the audience uh, after the committee has exhausted their uh, questions. Any questions? <laughs> All right, John. And why don't you start, before you get into your presentation, just give us a quick blur minute or two about <laughs> your interest in getting into this type of project. Okay. This doesn't count towards your 35. Okay. Minutes. Okay, good. That's I wasn't counting it when I told you. Um, yeah, so just a quick intro about how this project came into fruition. Um, I got here fall of 2020 and I wasn't quite sure what my research interests were. I was kind of leaning towards transfer of training and track. I was a track coach at the time. And but I wasn't sold on it. So I was kind of debating it, but wasn't quite ready, wasn't quite sold on that particular research topic, you know, but I met Dr. Dickinson and that led to a couple conversations and we realized we had shared interests, particularly in mitochondrial function, uh, skeletal muscle physiology and aging. And those, those conversations led to an independent study where I would go and read research papers and you'd send me one, I'd go read it, what I learned, what I didn't, didn't quite know. And these papers are mostly on like, uh, autophagy and skeletal muscle and mitochondrial function, you know, and then at week seven, I think, or eight, he brought up bioinformatics and RNA sequencing. And I didn't really know what it was. I kind of had like a cursory understanding, but really didn't have any idea what it was, but I was really interested in it. So I read a couple of papers and then he posed to me, I can either make, write a review paper, I think on mitochondrial function or autophagy and skeletal muscle or work with some sequencing data he had. And instantly I was sequencing data, but I think I might've said like, give me a week, maybe, I don't know. But instantly it was sequencing just cause it was interesting. You know, I didn't know anything about it except some words. And so this that kind of led to it, my, 10 month, 10 month, my 10 month project and where we are now. And bioinformatics is kind of, what we've kind of, or what I've kind of learned is that there's a lot of like jargon and like kind of fancy words and, you know, terms associated with it. I'm going to do my best to kind of break down the terms that are pertinent to the project or to the presentation to make it a little more digestible. Um, and I'll kind of go over those when they arise during the presentation. And so that brings me to uh, this project here, the impact of aging on the transcriptional profile of human skeletal muscle. Transcriptional profile is kind of just a fancy word for the RNA transcripts, which are present within the cell um, at any given moment, if you will. And I've, I've done a couple projects, or not projects, um, presentations on aging while I've been here, and I've kind of exhausted my cool introductions. I've done a couple cool ones, but I think half of the people in here, I've kind of seen them. So I've shown on my cards, so we're kind of just going to get into it. Um, the qu first question I want to pose is, what happens to skeletal muscle as we age? There's a few ways we can tackle this question. We can do it the first way in kind of just looking at our older population around us. And we kind of can make a, some visual assessments. The first one being they might be, have, they might have, you know, smaller muscle bellies than maybe someone who's younger, maybe. Um, they might be more susceptible to fatigue. They might uh, have trouble uh, completing activities of daily living. You know, that's one way to go about the question. Thankfully, I have two MRI cross-sections here that we can look at as well to make it a little more maybe scientific. And so the first one MRI cross-section that I have is of the vast, uh, excuse me, of the thigh region of a 23-year-old male. And so if we kind of look at this MRI cross-section, we see a couple things. The first thing is that this dark gray region here is skeletal muscle or muscle tissue. And towards the top of this figure, or excuse me, picture, we can see the quadriceps complex here at the top. What we also see is the bone here, this light region here, I believe is bone marrow. And the next thing we can see is this light region on the periphery of this image here. So this light region is subcutaneous fat, presumably, or adipose tissue. And we also see these lighter regions here infiltrating the muscle. And so that could be a few different things. It could be collagen fibrils, it could be you know, just connective tissue or adipose tissue. Um, Non-contractile tissue essentially is what we're going to call it. And so if we compare this cross-section to a cross-section of a 77-year-old male, 
we can see some very distinct differences. The first thing that comes to my eyes is this increase in the subcutaneous fat around the periphery of the image. And I also see a lot of these lighter regions that are infiltrating the muscle belly. And again, this must, this, uh, light, these lighter regions are what we're going to call non-contractile tissue. And so we see these visual differences between these two images. So what's the result? What, what, is a, what is a result of these two differences in skeletal muscle morphology? Well, we can say that likely this individual might have decreased strength, increased fatigue when doing daily activities. It might be harder for this individual to complete activities of daily living. So picking something up off the ground, carrying groceries, picking something or grabbing something from overhead. This individual may have impaired glucose regulation or might have trouble handling glucose and disposing of glucose adequately. Well, what else? This individual might have an increased risk of falling, an increased susceptibility to illness, as well as increased recovery time due to musculoskeletal injury. So that's one way we can tackle this question, what happens to skeletal muscle as we age? What I wanted to do for this project was look at the molecular environment within the cell Specifically, look at the molecular environment associated with these two phenotypes in skeletal muscle. And a little more specifically, look at the RNA transcripts within the cell to see if there's a difference in gene expression between these two, this 23-year-old male and the 77-year-old male. We're going to get, and again, we're going to get into RNA sequencing and kind of how these data came to fruition um, in a bit. And so that brings me to my aims and hypotheses. hypotheses. The first hy hypothesis being Biological aging will be associated with differentially expressed up and down regulated genes. That's just to say that if we look at the gene expression between a young person and an old person, the gene expression won't be the same. There'll be some genes that are different between the two. The second being specific clusters of genes will be most significantly associated with aging. So not only will there be individual genes that are different, but there will be groups of genes that have similar functions that will also be different. And then three, Aging will be associated with changes in various biological processes and pathways. So these clusters of genes will be associated with different processes that take place within our body, and presumably those processes may be impacted as well. So now onto the methods, and I'm gonna outline specifically what was done here at Central, what I did as a part of my project, as opposed to what was done previous to me getting the data. But I think it's beneficial just to see the entire life cycle of how these data came to fruition. So first, we had subjects that came in, they had bi biopsies of the vastus lateralis, and these are bi basal mu muscle biopsies that were taken at rest. Next, we had RNA isolated from the samples and genes identified. So we just want the RNA within these muscle samples, and we look at the, uh, and then from that RNA, we can determine which genes these RNA, these RNA transcripts originated from. And again, we're gonna go into this in a little more detail um, in the next couple slides. Three, Differential expression is evaluated, and now that we have a gene list, we pass this gene list down into on, online web tools that can draw some further insight for us. And then finally, these gene clusters and individual genes identified for further investigation, or now that we know which genes are differentially expressed, we can and which, I guess, clusters or processes are associated with, we can get a better idea of what genes might be more important for further research. A little bit about our subjects. So if we look here, we have two groups. We have a young group and an old group. Young group had eight males, one female. The old group had six males, three females. Each had nine subjects. And there are various cardiorespiratory measures on the table above. But what I want to draw your eyes to are the age. So the, the young group had a mean age of around 27 years old. And the old group had a mean age of around 68 years old. So that gives us a 40 year difference between our two groups. So before we get into the results, the findings, differential expression, I want to take two slides to go over what exactly RNA sequencing is. Um, and I've done this a few times, a few different ways. When I explain this to a few different people, I've said uh, person X, person Y, and gene X, gene Y, and it, it never pans out, it never works. I always get crossed to, people always, what about person Z? And you know, does gene X go to person Y? It, it just doesn't work. To make this a little bit more concrete, we're going to imagine we have two part, two subjects, one from the young group, one from the old group, and we're going to follow their, I guess, life cycle of their data all the way down to identifying differentially expressed genes. Now imagine we have 
Susan and Bill. Now this is de-identified data. Susan and Bill do not exist. They are fictitious people. You know, but it just makes it a lot easier if we can put a name to our participants instead of saying person X and person Y. So let's imagine Susan and Bill uh, come, to the, come to the lab after uh, overnight fast, um, controlling for nutritional intake, um, no caffeine, no alcohol, no physical activity. Again, these are basal muscle biopsies. Take a muscle biopsy of the vastus lateralis and we isolate the RNA within those cells. So that's th those muscle biopsies presumably are a collection of cells. There's different molecules associated with those cells. You have proteins, you can have connective tissue, maybe a few different things maybe in that muscle biopsy, but we only want the RNA. So we do away with everything else, keep the RNA within those muscle biopsies, spe specifically Bill and Susan's muscle biopsies. Next, we can send those muscle biopsies to a commercial facility, and these facilities have a special machine called a sequencer. Now what this sequencer can do is read the nucleotide sequence of each RNA transcript within those samples. So the nucleotides, there's A's, U's, G's, and C's. It can read the sequence of all the RNA transcripts within those samples. And so in Susan and Bill's case, they both, the sequencer of the machine said, okay, I find one transcript that says A, U, G, U, G, C. And then another one that says G, G, C, A, A, U, et cetera, et cetera. So once we know the sequence, the RNA sequence, what we then can do is map that sequence back to the genome. So if we remember for a moment, all of our genetic material is encoded in these regions of our DNA called genes. Now, genes, the flow of information usually goes DNA to RNA to protein, and then the protein is what goes and does most of the functions within the cell. An RNA transcript had to have been transcribed from some region of our DNA. So if we know the sequence of that RNA transcript, we can kind of look back and map it back to the genome and say, okay, what gene did this RNA transcript originate from? And what gene is that, or in what function does that gene usually play within the literature? And we can kind of get an idea of what we're, what's going on within our samples. So in Susan and Bill's case, their, their RNA sequence that we read maps back to gene X. This is okay, we know this RNA transcript goes back to gene X. Now we can count the number of reads for Susan and Bill. So for gene X, Susan had one count, let's say, and for Bill, he had three counts for gene X. Okay, we're doing a little better. So let's imagine now that Susan goes back to the young cohort, Bill goes back to the old cohort, and we do this again with our, I think, 16 other participants. They come to the lab, they get a muscle biopsy, you isolate the RNA, and keep going down that trend. And let's say for Susan in the young group, we get a mean count of 10 counts for gene X. For Bill in the old group, we get a mean count of 50 counts for gene X. Well, that would be a, that we would then say that gene X is differentially expressed in the old group compared to the young group. Now, a good way to think about this is if I say I have $500 and I have more money, you would all say, well, more money compared to who? You can't just say you have more money. You have to, who are you comparing yourself to? It's the same, I have to have a reference group, another way to say that. And so in our, and it's the same, it's the same process in this study in that we have to have a, pro, uh, a uh, reference group when we say a gene has, is upregulated or has a higher expression, we have to be comparing something to something else. And so in this study, the young group is our reference group and the old group is the group that has the differentially expressed gene. So in this case, we would say gene X has a higher expression in the old group when we compare it to the young group. I think I did, I think I got that one pretty good. Okay, okay, good. Can I just ask a quick clarifier? Yeah. Will every gene you look at be higher or lower expressed between the two groups? I will the, well, they might not have the same exact count. They might be different, but they might not all be significant, like significantly expressed. So each gene has a, a significance value associated with it. And in our example, let's say the young group, again, had 10 or the old group had 50. Well, that might be a difference, but we need to know if that's significantly different or not. So that kind of answers the question. So there's some statistics involved. There's some statistics involved, yes. So if we kind of get in, so this is where I kind of got the data set. I got a list, a data set with genes and counts and some other stuff associated with it. This is where I kind of started my analysis. And so if we look at all, all samples, we get a total of around 21,000 total genes identified. 
And so that means if it's you see Susan and Bill, for example, if Susan, we identified Gene Y, but in Bill, we didn't identify Gene Y, it still would be included in that 21,000 number of genes identified. But now, like we just mentioned, so we have genes that have, may have different counts associated between the two groups. We have to figure out a way to find the genes that are actually signif statistically significant in their differential expression. Well, the first thing we do is kind of visualize these 21,000 genes. It's hard to do, but we can do a good job with a special scatter plot called a volcano plot. And so on the volcano plot presented here, first we I want to draw our eyes as to is the x-axis. Now the x-axis is the, excuse me, the unit is log two of the fold change. Now, many genes, they might have different expression, expression counts associated with them. One might have a difference in 10,000 counts. One might have a difference in 100 counts. Well, it's hard to visualize 10,000 next to 10 in a good manner on the same x-axis. What the log two of the fold change does is a transformation that allows us to visualize those two genes with vastly different expression values on the same x-axis. Like, next to each other. I'm sure, I'm sure most of you have seen maybe that like logarithmic paper that have the many lines and it's kind of looks kind of weird. It's hard to interpret and hard to use. This kind of does away with that pretty well. On the y-axis we see the negative log of the q value. The q value is just a more strict p-value. What the negative log transformation does is if we were to just plot just the q value as we all know, as a, as a p-value or a significance value gets more significant, it'll go closer and closer to zero. It'll get lower and lower. And so if we just plot it as is, the very significant genes will just get closer and closer and closer to the x-axis, and you won't be able to see the genes that might be more significant. You won't be able to parse it out. What the negative log transformation does is it puts those genes that are more significant towards the top of the figure. And then the last thing I want to point out is this line here. This dotted line here is where we set our significance threshold. So each of these gray circles are genes that did not meet our significance threshold and they were no longer included in our analysis. These red circles here are individual genes that had a higher expression in the old group when compared to the young group. These blue circles here are individual, or, yeah, are individual genes that had a lower expression in the old group compared to the young group. And these red and blue circles, respectively, are, uh, they were statistically significant in our, in our, I guess, evaluation, so they continued in our analysis. Labeled here at the top are our top 10 most significantly differentially expressed genes. And so if we were to rank our genes by Q value and have the genes with the lowest Q value at the top and take the top 10, we can map the gene symbol to where they are in the figure and kind of get a, it kind of adds just a little bit of a, I don't know, you'd say maybe visual flavor, if you will, and kind of get an idea of what genes are at the top of, or the most significantly differentially expressed. And so a little more information about this figure here. We had 1,515 differentially expressed genes. So both red and blue circles on this figure add up to around 1,500. Two, there are 729 upregulated genes. So there are 729 of the red circles there on the right. 786 of the genes were downregulated. So there's 786 of those blue circles there on the left. Okay, we're doing a good job. We started out with 21,000 genes, and that's a lot, and we're able to distill that down to 1,500. It's doing better, but that's still a lot of genes, and we gotta kind of do better in finding the genes that we wanna investigate further. So what we can do is, I think on, on the methods, I had mentioned these online web tools that we can use. So these web tools that we can use is, is a piece of software on the internet where we can pass our gene list down, our differentially expressed genes, so this 1,515 genes, and what this web tool does is it looks at our gene list and it says, okay, compared to a completely random list of 1,500 genes, your, ge your list has more genes associated with uh, glycolysis. And it has these five genes which are associated with uh, skeletal muscle contraction. It kind of starts grouping these genes together based on their associated function. So if we take a more concrete example, when we look at this figure here on the left, let's imagine that we pass our gene list down into this web tool and it said, okay, those four genes there on the left, on the top or left, those four genes, RAB, EBP1, PHK1, GREM1, and RP11, other numbers, those, that one, those four over there. Let's imagine they group those four together 
And I said, these four genes have a similar function in X biological process. And it gives us an output. And this output has, I think, around 360 clusters. So th that grouping would be called a cluster of genes. What we now can do with this output is plot it to get a better idea of what we're looking at. We can generate a scatter plot. And if we look at the scatter plot here, if we take a look, take a moment and look at the x-axis, we see E-score. E-score is just a significance value associated with these clusters, kind of similar to a p-value. Fold enrichment on the y-axis is just the uh, magnitude of change from baseline. And if we go back to our example and we imagine those four genes map to that cluster there. Now, just to be clear, I can almost guarantee that these four genes up here do not map specifically to this cluster here. They are likely somewhere in here, but not specifically to that one. The point of that arrow, essentially, is to get the point across that these are individual genes, and this is a cluster of genes or a group of genes. It can be anywhere from 3 to 20. It's just not an individual gene. Okay, and I believe this has around, I don't know, 40 or 50 clusters in this scatter plot specifically. But we can do better than that. We can start to identify the relevant clusters within this scatter plot because there's still a good amount. There's around 40 clusters here. We still got to identify the ones that we should look at further. So we have the same scatter plot here, but what we can do is identify the relevant clusters. And if you remember, this x axis here is our significance value, e score is our significance value, or our p value. So if we move left on the x-axis here, we get clusters that have a lower p-value or lower e-score or are more significant on the left side. And if we go up the y-axis here, we get clusters that have a higher magnitude of change or a higher fold enrichment. And so what we can do is we can focus our eyes to this upper left quadrant here to identify clusters that may be more relevant for further research because they have a lower p-value and a higher magnitude of change. So if we can draw a visual box around that top left quadrant, and then we can plot those clusters on, the, on a bar plot to get a better visual, a, better, a higher resolution of what we're looking at. And if we look at this bar plot here, we see a whole host of different biological processes. We have protein ubiquination, viral modulation, protein nuclear import. We can do better. We can now start to identify some patterns within these clusters to kind of get a better idea of what's going on. And specifically with this one, we can see that we have two out of the seven relevant clusters that are uh, associated with glycogen metabolism. And so that gives us a better uh, avenue to look down further as opposed to the 21,000 genes we, we began with. Now I just showed you one scatter plot. That scatter plot and these web tools are associated with what's called the gene ontology. A gene ontology is an online database that kind of houses inf this information. If you look in the literature and you look at these genes, there might be, these genes might be studied under cancer research, under lung pathologies, a lot of different cells and a lot of different, um, I guess, pathologies associated with these genes. What these web tools do can say, okay, all the literature I looked at, you know, PHKA1 is predominantly associated with glycolysis, and I'm going to group it with also ATF4 and these other genes that are also associated with glycolysis. And so it's the database that we use to kind of get this standardized uh, uh, function of these genes. And I showed you one, but there are three other biological domains that are housed within this database. The first one was biological processes, which we just saw. The second one is cellular component. A cellular component asks the question, okay, the protein that these genes encode for, where are they localized within the cell? Is it the cytosol? Is it the nucleoplasm? Is it the cell membrane? Where are these proteins usually localized to do their function? And an example would be the nuclear membrane. Three, the molecular function. So what molecular functions within the cell do the, the proteins that these genes encode for carry out? An example would be transcription factor binding. And then finally, we have biological pathways. So what pathway within the body, such as glycolysis, gluconeogenesis, does this, do these genes, are these genes associated with? Okay, now with these web tools, we can pass in our entire list of 1500 differentially expressed genes to get a certain output. But what we can also do, if a, list, if a gene is differentially expressed, as we saw earlier, it either has a higher expression or a lower expression. It's not the same. So we can also pass in just the upregulated genes 
as well as just the downregulated genes to get a higher resolution of what we're seeing. There's a lot of redundancy when we do when we split up the genes into three different lists, you know, but the, you might see some differences and it gives you a higher resolution or it gives you a better picture of what's going on associated with upregulated genes and the downregulated genes. Once we do this and we do the scatter plot and we identify the top left quadrant, that results and that resulted in I think 12 different scatter plots, six bar plots, and I think like 16 tables. There's a lot of data, and so we weren't a we can't go into all the data. Unfortunately, we can only go into a specific vein that Dr. Dickinson and I identified pretty early on. But to give you an overarching kind of idea of what we saw, again, I mentioned there are 360 clusters that we got, or 360 groupings of genes. If we look at all the clusters, so all 360 clusters, not just the clusters in the top left quadrant, we see that 25% of those clusters are associated with energy homeostasis, protein binding, and cell membrane formation. Okay, it's, it's pretty good, but we can do better than that. If we limit our search or our clusters just to the ones in the top left quadrant or the ones that are a little more significant, we see that 41% of those clusters are associated with glycolysis, insulin signaling, and glycogen metabolism. And I believe the top left quadrant uh, clusters results in, I think, 30 were in the top left quadrant, and 41% of 30, I think that's like maybe 12 or 11, 11 or 12 clusters associated with these, th these pathways. So 360 clusters down to 11, that gives us a better idea of a more manageable amount of genes and clusters to look into further. Okay. I mentioned that these are clusters of genes. So it's anywhere from three to 20. And now that we only have 11 that we're gonna pursue further, we can now look at the individual genes associated with those clusters. And there was a specific procedure that we employed, and maybe we can get into it after the presentation's finished, but procedure we employed after this procedure, two genes came up to the top as worthy of uh, further interest or further investigation. And so the first gene that came to the top was PHKA1. Now, if we look at the bar plot here, we see we have our two groups, young and old, on the x-axis. And on the y-axis, we have normalized counts. Now, we didn't get into exactly what normalized counts are in RNA sequencing, but just for this purpose, just imagine they're just counts. And we have the mean of those counts here, that's presented here. And so for the young group, we had around 2,000 counts for PHKA1. And for the old group, we had around 850 counts for PHKA1 as well. So this is a significant difference, and PHK1 is, has a lower expression or is downregulated in the older group. So what does PHKA1, what does this gene, what does the protein that this gene encodes for do? PHKA1 encodes for the regulatory site of the enzyme phosphorylase kinase. Now phosphorylase kinase is a very important enzyme in glycogen degradation or glycogen metabolism. Specifically, it regulates glycogen phosphorylase. Glycogen phosphorylase is directly responsible for liberating glucose from its stored form, glu uh, glycogen. Phosphorylase kinase is active under three predominant conditions. The first one being an increase in calcium concentration, so presumably under skeletal muscle contractions, then this uh, enzyme would be active. Increased glucagon concentration, so maybe we've gone a couple hours without a meal, then we're going to see an increase in this enzyme's activity. Increased epinephrine concentration, so say we're in a heightened state or we're exercising or something similar, we're also going to see an increase in this enzyme's concentration. Okay, let's take a minute to kind of recap what we've seen so far. So what does this mean? What have we seen and what does this mean? So first, glucose and glycogen metabolism may be altered within the cell. We saw that when we looked at the relevant clusters and we saw that you know, 41% of those 30 clusters were associated with insulin signaling and glycogen metabolism. So we can kind of say that glucose or glycogen metabolism may be altered within the cell. Second, that's supported by the presence of individual genes. So PHKA1 is encodes for a protein that is very important for glycogen metabolism. So that kind of supports the first point. No, but the next logical question is why? Like, why are we seeing this change in glycolytic activity? Like, what might be causing that? And the first thing that came to my mind was, okay, maybe it's because we're looking at skeletal muscle and that's a very uh, metabolically active tissue. That's why we're seeing this, this change. You know, but we took muscle, skeletal muscle samples of 
all the participants, not just one or another. They're all skeletal muscle biopsies, so they're all metabolically active. We wouldn't see any difference. The next thing that came to my mind was, well, maybe it's because they had an overnight fast and, you know, increased glucagon concentration. Maybe they're all hungry. Well, they all did an overnight fast, so if they all were hungry, we still wouldn't see a difference in either cell type or either group. The third thing that came to my mind was, okay, increased calcium concentrations, maybe the exercise before they came in, but we controlled for that too because these are muscle, basal muscle biopsies after controlling for physical activity. And so with that in mind, we can kind of look at other research to see what other conditions within the cell lead to an increase in glucose activity. And I only want to look at one paper. I believe it's a pretty good paper. What these researchers did was they harvested rat hearts. And they harvested rat hearts and they pla placed these rat hearts under three separate conditions. And they wanted to look at the difference in glycolytic activity due to these three experimental conditions. The first one being ischemic conditions. So they restricted the blood flow to these three rat hearts. The second condition being a hypoxic or anoxin condition or low oxygen availability. The third condition being they took some of the cells and they introduced some bacterial agents to inhibit certain complexes within the electron transport chain and see the change in glycolytic activity due to that. What they found was, if we look at the figure here, we look at the x-axis, we have our normal oxygen control. So these are rat hearts just, that just have no, no experimental condition was given to them. We have ischemic conditions and anox conditions. And on the right side, we see we have our DMSO control, which is just a DMSO is just a solvent and it's just a control for those cells. And we have oligomycin and antimycin. Now, oligomycin inhibits ATP synthase of the electron transport chain. Antimycin inhibits complex three of the electron transport chain, overall impeding oxidative phosphorylation. On the x-axis, we have PFK2 activity. Now, PFK2 is a close cousin to an enzyme we all know, or PFK1, phosphofructokinase. Phosphofructokinase is, a very, is the primary site of regulation in glycolysis, and it is otherwise known as the committed step. So we have a glucose that comes in, hexokinase acts on it, these other enzymes transform this molecule, but at a certain point, we can still go to store glycogen if we want. We don't have to go all the way down glycolysis. But once phosphofructokinase acts on that molecule, now we have to complete glycolysis. We can no longer go back to scored glycogen. So if we look at this figure here, we see that all of our experimental conditions, both the ischemic and anoxic, and our inhib inhibition of electron transport chain re resulted in an increase in this enzyme's activity. Because it's a close seven of PFK1, the authors also concluded that it's, presumed, it's safe to say that phosphofructokinase activity also may have been increased as well. So I mentioned earlier that we had two genes of interest. Now we saw the first one, PHK1, but there's another one that also kind of rounds out this picture and what we're seeing. And that second gene of interest is ATF3. And so we have the same figure here, same group, same y-axis, and we see ATF3 for the young group had around 75 normalized counts. And for the old group had around 16 normalized counts. So ATF3 would have a lower expression or be downregulated in the old group compared to the young group. But what is ATF3, what is the protein that ATF3 encodes for? What does it do? Like what is its function? One, it's a transcription factor. And then uh, importantly, two, it is a part of the integrated stress response. Now, the integrated stress response is a cascade of intracellular cell signaling events that occurs when the cell is perturbed in some way. So if there's some, if there's a low nutrient availability, if there's low oxygen availability, if some, if there's some state within the cell that moves it from cellular homeostasis, then the integrated stress response is going to be activated, if you will. Now, the integrated stress response is trying to save the cell. It's trying to, you know, fix whatever is wrong, bring it back to homeostasis, and then, you know, carry on with that, with that cell's day. But if the integrated stress response is active for too long and it's still going, it's like, okay, well, we've been going for, I don't know how long, but we've gone for a certain amount of time and it's still not, we're still not getting back to homeostasis, well, then the cell undergoes programmed cell death or apoptosis. Thirdly, ATF3 is associated with hypoxic conditions. So when we see hypoxic conditions within the cell and then the integrated stress response, then we see a more robust increase in ATF3 activity.
Finally, what's very interesting is its expression is inversely correlated with PINK1. Now, PINK1 is very important in mitochondrial autophagy, or what's called mitophagy. PINK1, when there's a section of the mitochondria that might not be acting or, you know, functioning correctly, maybe we have some misfolded proteins, or maybe, you know, it's just not working as it should, PINK1 localizes to the membrane of the mitochondria, and that section of mitochondria will be degraded or uh, degraded due to autophagy so that we can maintain some good, mitochond good mitochondrial function within the cell. Oh, okay, so went through a long process of going from 21,000 genes down to, you know, 1,500 genes, down to 360 clusters, down to 30 clusters, down to 11, down to 2. So we did, we did this whole process, and I think we saw four figures, a couple bar plots and a scatter, couple scatter plots. But just to give you an idea, this is not even all of the figures that were generated in this project. You know, we have bar plots with the upregulated gene list, downregulated. We have a heat map up there. Um, and unfortunately, we just can't get into all of it. Um, if you want to go into it after the defense, I'd be happy to. I mean, I've talked to, to Dr. Dickinson has to listen to me, but you guys don't. So if you guys want to get into it, we can do it. But unfortunately, we just didn't have time. <laughs> That's kind of going. How many figures and tables? Uh, in total, in total figures and tables, around 40 to 50, I think 40 to 50 is probably a good, if we include the review of lit, it's probably closer to 60, so 60, so, so a good, a good amount. And, and did you just blame Dr. Dickinson for that? still need one more signature. So... What are the strengths and limitations associated with this project? The first one being we cannot make inferences about the protein environment. So we have to remember that DNA is transcribed, goes to RNA, and then it's translated to a protein. That protein is what does most of the functions within the cell. You know, but that relationship is not one-to-one -one from transcription to translation. The RNA transcript might be transcribed, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's going to become a protein. So we can't make inferences about the protein environment unless you actually look at the protein concentration within the cell. Second, is this due to aging or lifestyle? So this is kind of a, um, a question with all aging research is that you see these differences due to aging, but you know, if that person wasn't an athlete, are you going to see the same presentation? Or if this person didn't have that stretch where they ate fast food for 10 years, you know, are you going to see the same presentation? Like even if you take the same person, you go from that person X from 10 years old to 90 years old, you know, it's hard to say, okay, what happened just it was inevitable because they got older and what happened to the lifestyle. So that's kind of a, a, a limitation. However, we analyzed the entire transcriptome. So if, I don't know if you guys are familiar with some other um, gene expression technology, but we have microarray, we have northern blot or PCR. And what these, these, these uh, procedures specifically, you have to do, you have to identify genes, what's called a priori. And a priori just means before you do your experiment, you have to say, okay, I'm going to look at PHKA1 and ATF3, and then I'm going to do this procedure and see how these two genes change. And that might be fine. You might see a change in those two genes, but let's say that, you know, another gene was actually changed, but you won't be able to see that because you didn't develop your primers for that gene. You only looked at those two. So it kind of restricts you. But if we look at the entire transcriptome or every single gene or all the transcripts, well, now we don't have to restrict ourselves to just a few certain genes before we start our experimental procedure, which is a pretty good plus. And finally, what are some take-home messages? I think, as we saw, glucose and glycogen metabolism may be altered within the cell. I think we know, especially in this uh, program, that exercise is a very potent stimulator of protein synthesis, mitochondrial biogenesis, and that might make new proteins in order to save the, or the, uh, uh, the and metabolic function within the cell. And it also upregulates mitophagy or autophagy and recycles some of these enzymes that might not be functioning correctly. So exercise maybe to preserve the function of skeletal muscle and kind of prevent this, uh, these changes that we're seeing. Second, like I mentioned earlier, we followed one vein of kind of research that Dr. Dickinson and I identified in glycolysis, glycogen regulation, and kind of went down that rabbit hole. But there's a few other avenues that seemed pretty promising. The first one being a lot of the clusters were associated with cell membrane and skeletal formation. And there's actually a lot of a good amount of research backing this one up as well. 
And then finally, protein ubiquination and skeletal muscle contraction were also very prominent in the data that we saw as well. We just didn't have time to go through all avenues. We had to pick one. And glycogen and glucose metabolism seem like the most fruitful endeavor. Finally, what are the metabolic func what what is the metabolic function's effect on skeletal muscle structure and function? So how does this perturbation in glycolytic activity affect the structure of skeletal muscle? And that might be an avenue for, for future research. Finally, I want to say thank you. Thank you to my committee, Dr. DeLugos, Dr. Dickinson, and Dr. D. This was a very fruitful endeavor to incorporate everything I enjoy from RNA sequencing, bioinformatics, mitochondrial function, you know, metabolism. And it was, it was a lot of work, but it was very fun. Uh, I don't know if you guys know Colton Hart. Thank you to Colton Hart for being my, my minion this year, and helping me analyze the data. And then finally, I want to say thank you to one more person. So throughout this year and last year, we'll have conversations with people. I'll have conversations with people, and they'll mention, like, good, good students. Oh, like John, like, you're a good student. And I'm like, I'm, thank you. I'm flattered that you think so highly of me, but... You know, I wasn't always a great student. I think I'm, I'm decent now, but I, know, I, will use, I wasn't always, you know, decent. If I got a C plus or a B minus, like we were, in, we were rolling. We were rolling and we were, <laughs> we were in good terms. Um, and I think you all know I was an athlete at UC Irvine. And the coaches tell the athletes, well, you got here on your own cord and your own merit. And it's like, come on, okay, we know it's not 100% accurate. And, you know, not only do we know it, but the other students know it and the faculty know it. Everybody knows it. And there's kind of this aura of like, and I don't think the professors mean to do it, but it's like this, like, uh, these low expectations for these athletes. And then I have a low expectation for myself because it's like, okay, well, I didn't get here for academics. You know, maybe I'm not uh, up to par, up to speed. And there was one professor who, oh, I hope I don't get all emotional. Wow. One professor, my sophomore year, who sat me down and he was like, John, this class will be very hard. I don't care if you spend an hour on it. I don't care if you spend 40 hours a week learning the material. You have to learn the material to this level to get an A or you're going to fail. Or this level to get a B or you'll fail. It doesn't matter how hard you work. You have to learn it. And I said, okay. And he said, however, I'm going to help you every week. So I went to his office hours. Oh, Lord. <laughs> his office hours, his TA's office hours. And he helped me get through it. And I was Dr. Condole. His uh, biochemistry class was by far the hardest I've ever taken. Um, but after I got my, I think like 88 or 89%, um, I finally uh, looked at myself like an academic. Like I can do this work and maybe C plus B minus is uh, shooting a little low. So then I went for A's and stuff. And so thank you to Dr. Gondelay. And that is it. <laughs>